the model 1911 is this the most incredible firearm ever invented the best firearm that was ever invented well sit back relax and enjoy this informative video coming to you from straight shooter on weaponseducation.com on YouTube relax enjoy here is a tribute to the 1911 and I know a lot of you viewers love the 1911 like myself and before I tell you the whole story as we know it was it was invented by John Moses Browning and this is going to be a detailed story I've done my research before I tell you the story I want to bring you back to the mindset of the early 1900s between the year of 1900 and 1911 think of what they had what tools they had to invent things back then first of all obviously there was no air conditioning there was no central heating plumbing yeah go outside to the outhouse unless you lived in a major major large city electricity I don't think so you had candlelight you had no modern day conveniences and of course, they had nothing like computers and internet and all the things we have today to help inventors invent things. So when you have a person like John Moses Browning who had to go to a blacksmith with his brilliant mind and all of his ideas and come up with, with a, a, a patent for a specific gun for cult to manufacture as we go on with the story, it's just really amazing what he did in the early 1900s with the tools they had, the limitations he had to deal with. I mean, the, the Model T Ford came out in 1908. No one really even owned one until maybe 1914 or 15. And the few that could afford them could barely even learn how to start it. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're going back to the days of, of horse and wagons. And he developed a product that is still here a hundred years later and think of what products where's the Model T Ford today where are where are the vehicles that were invented in the early 1900s today or if we look at vehicles you can every decade they change drastically drastically even in the last 10 years now we have hybrids what an incredible an invention which was created a hundred years ago and today is still basically unchanged and being developed by modern manufacturers such as Kimber, Sig. I have a surprise there on the table by the way. Before I go on with the story let me show you what's on the table. I'm too excited. I picked up something new today. Let me show you what's on the table. You've seen some of these in the past. That I purchased about a month ago. Modern day Sig Sour 1911. Just incredible. I shot that. I love it. Modern day Kimber 3 inch 1911, incredible aluminum frame, incredible. Of course, that was purchased. Uh, that's a Delta Colt Delta Elite. I purchased that in 1987. That's a 10 millimeter. Back there is another Kimber 3 inch with a crimson trace. And here's my surprise. I'll do a whole special on this one on one. I had to buy it for this video. I just had to, had to, had to. I mean, we're talking a hundred years later, and when you hear the whole story, you're gonna realize that Samuel Colt and then John Moses Browning were buddies. They were pretty good friends because Browning invented it and Colt manufactured it. So I had to get in the year 2011 this brand new, brand new. It's got a low serial number. These just came out a few months ago, called the Colt. You see that rail gun? Oh gosh, a hundred years of service. The other side is even more beautiful. All right, so that's what's on the table. Let me get on with the story. Pick that up today. I couldn't help myself. I just had to buy it. Okay, well, I'll just let you look at those beautiful 1911s as I go on with the story. Now, like I said, think of back in the early 1900s, the tools they had to work with. Minimal, minimal. John Moses Browning was the inventor of the gun, and Samuel Colt 
ultimately manufactured it. That was that was Mo Mo Moses' uh, goal. That was John Moses' goal was for Colts to manufacture it. He ultimately achieved his goal, obviously, but it wasn't that easy. Here comes the story. Is it the most popular gun in history? Hmm, I think so. John Moses Browning was born on January 23rd, 1855. Think of that, 1855. Ogden, Utah. Go Utah. Arguably the most important figure within the development of modern, full, automatic, and semi-automatic handguns. And he is credited with 128 gun patents. He made his first firearm at the age of 13. What were you doing at the age of 13? I know what I was doing at the age of 13. I was shooting BB guns and, and cutting out of school early. He was, uh, he was just amazing. He did it in his father's gun shop. And he was awarded his first patent at the age of 24. A brilliant man with, with very little tools to work with. Browning influenced nearly all, all categories of firearms designs. He invented or made significant improvements to short rifles, lever action rifles, and slide action firearms. He did it all. He developed the first reliable and compact auto loading pistols by inventing the telescoping bolt, integrating the bolt and barrel shroud into what is now known as the slide. He invented the slide. Browning's telescoping bolt design is now found in nearly every modern semi-automatic pistol, still a hundred years later. His blacksmiths, what they designed together, is still here a hundred years later. And, 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 and that design is still seen in several modern, fully automatic weapons. He also developed the first gas-operated machine gun. Pretty cool. I'd like to own that one. It was called the Colt Dash Browning Model 1895. Or gun broker, I doubt it. Colt Browning Model 1895, a gas-operated machine gun. A system that suppressed machine recoil operation to become the standard for most high-power self-loading firearm designs worldwide. Him and Colt really had something going back then in the early 1900s. As the story goes on, during his life, well, he designed and developed firearms for his own company, as well as Winchester, Remington, of course, Colt, Savage Arms, and other companies who looked for Browning, as the brilliant man that he is, to develop firearms. Now, he was a genius, similar to like John Lennon. I don't know how to analyze this or, or give you an, al an analogy of it, but John Lennon, I mean, he, almost like a freak of nature to me, how, how brilliant that man was. The music he wrote, this is almost like equally, in the, when it comes to firearms and inventions, what John Moses Browning did. Just a genius. So other manufacturers looked upon him, like I said, Remington, Winchester, Colt, Savage Arms. You know, they say, hey John, can you, can, we need you to develop stuff so we can produce it and sell it. Uh, a little bit about his life, he, he died, um, a, he lived a long life, he lived to age 71, which was a long life back then. He died on November 26, 1926. And listen to how he died, it's, it's kind of neat, it's, you know, it's, it's sad that he died, but it's kind of neat how he died. He died while working on a pistol. He died of heart failure attempting to design an FN pistol with his son. His son's name was Valley Browning. And he was trying to design a 9mm self-loading pistol and died doing what he loved. Inventing quality firearms. Browning is the most important person in firearm history, possibly. This is my opinion. I don't want to be biased. If not, if he's not the most important, he's up there in the top five. Along with Samuel Colt and a few others. I have a whole other video coming out on Samuel Colt, Smith & Wesson. Dozens of videos coming out, so stay excited. Okay. Now, they go arm in arm together. This is Samuel Colt and Browning. They go arm in arm together, and they said... Let's let's talk about uh, this gun some more. Let's develop a gun so that the U.S. Army will adopt it. 
and on March 29th, 1911, Colt was adopted with Browning's design as the standard pistol for the U.S. Army. Well, it wasn't all that easy. We got to go back in time and see how that all came about. And this is where my my research came in because we all know that 1911. You know, basically most people know that in 1911 Browning designed it and Colt manufactured it. That's pretty common knowledge if you're one of us gun enthusiasts. But it didn't come that easy for them. Like. Nothing comes easy in life. You have to work hard for it. So how did it come about? Well, what happened was there was a general, a general named Crozier. And in 1901, Crozier said, well, we got some problems where we've got here, we've got a war going on, and we are fighting the Moro guerrillas during the Philippine-American War. The then standard Colt M1892 revolver, 1892, huh? And 38 long Colt was found to be unsuitable for the for the these guys fighting in the jungle warfare. I mean, the the, the soldiers in the jungle warfare, particularly in the terms of stopping power, as the Moros had a very high battle morale and frequently used drugs to inhibit the sensation of pain. Huh. Sounds like some modern day wars going on now in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, what happened was, the US Army said, hey, we need to come up with a gun that's more powerful than the 38 Long Colt. And what they briefly did was they went back in time and went back to their 1873 single action revolver 45 Colt caliber. So they went from a 38 long Colt to a 45 cal Colt caliber, and that was a standard for a few decades. And they had problems with the 38 long Colt, and then the 45 Colt revolvers went into place in the Philippines in 1902. And finally, this general said, "We need, you know, more than six rounds for a new service pistol. The contest is on." The contest is on. In 1904, a colonel named Thompson stated that the new pistol should not be less than a 45 caliber and would be preferably a semi-automatic in operation. And then in 1906, trials began from six firearm manufacturers company. Uh, a couple of them were Colt, Savage Arms, Webley, and a few others. Of the six designs submitted to the U.S. Army, three were eliminated early on, and basically it was it left only Savage and Colt to battle it out. Colt and Savage kept resubmitting their designs, and during a series of field tests from 1907 to 1911, both designs were improved between testing their initial entries leading up to a series of tests before the adoption of the army. Meaning that from 1907 to 1911 Savage Arms and Colt just kept throwing out their the best of the best and Colt was depending on on, on Browning to keep making this product better and better and better. And what happened after that was John Browning decided to prove his superior of his design and he went to Hartford, Connecticut and he just sat there 24-7 and said, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to develop this product and it's going to win the contest. It's a, it's a pretty cool story as it goes on here. Theodore Roosevelt appointed the general, as I mentioned, early in the 1900s and what they did during during all of the testing, they actually used cadavers or live cattle to see how these handguns performed and it was just a really cool contest between Savage Arms and Colt. What happened was after many endurance tests, specifically one held on March 15, 1911, 
The U.S. Army, um, they held a test and they asked one man to fire the Colt 1,000 times in 38 minutes as part of a 6,000 round test. So he did that six times. On March 23, 1911, the Army reported of the two pistols, the board was of the opinion that the Colt is superior. The reasons why it was superior was number one, its endurance. Number two, it didn't fail all that often. Number three, it was easier to reassemble. And there's a number of reasons. Number four, if you had to add products to a broken part, it was more accurate to shoot thereafter. It was easier to clean. And it won the final decision. And I think I said this earlier. The Colt Model 1873 Peacemaker was the gun that won the West, but the Colt Model 1911 became the gun that won everything else. Just an incredible story. That's my take on it. And what's really neat also is that modern day manufacturers like Kimber and Six Sour, and I understand now Ruger's got a new 1911 out. After a hundred years, they're still doing it. Think of your iPod your, or your, your iPhone or, or your modern day telephone. How often do you have to change that? Every two, three years? Not so with a 1911. That's why I went and picked up that baby, that Colt. We'll do a special on that. That new Colt built in 2011. Ah, that's exciting. One more last thing I want to mention and I'll let you go. But this is an interesting point. Did your mom uh, ever do any sewing? Or maybe even today she does some sewing. Maybe she has a Singer sewing machine. Did you realize that Singer manufactured 1911s? The model was called, you can Google this, the M1 1911A1. It is the, one of the most sought after 1911 models. Values have increased significantly. I mean, up to $25,000 each. A low end one in bad shape is $7,000. If you're going to buy one, you want to authenticate it by using x-ray testing to, de to determine that it was not tampered with. Whether the serial numbers or the slide or restampings or anything wasn't tampered with. Singer Sewing Machine Company actually made 1911s. They got involved. They only made 500 of them. They had an order for 500 in 1940. So there you have it. My take on Moses Browning. Born in Ogden, Utah, died at the age of 71. His religion was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was a spiritual man, according to my research. And in 1977, his company uh, was acquired by FN. And some of the pistols he's most notable for, besides the 1911, is the Browning Automatic Rifle and the Browning Auto-5. Straight Shooter checking out, WeaponsEducation.com. I hope you learned something on this. I did. I love this 1911. I want another one. I got one today. I want a new one tomorrow. What's wrong with us, guys? We, we, we just can't stop. <laughs> checking out. Thank you, guys and ladies.